on customer satisfaction. Sounded very simple, but with the time, it garnered interest, and by the time I was disseminating it when I was defending my final thesis, it sounded more interesting than simple. I'm talking about services affecting customer satisfaction. The customers of the government of Kenya include its citizens, civil servants, local businesses, and international businesses. Are they satisfied? Are they happy with the services offered by the government of Kenya? We live in a technology-driven world where service experience is a matter of great importance. Are the services offered by our government in tandem with the digital ecosystem? With us today, our great discussions will demystify the myth of whether services by the government meet expectation. So let us put our hands together as we welcome our guests this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wino, uh, the Dean School of Business. At this particular point in time, I will request that we play a short documentary. Uh, I hope the team is ready. We are playing a short documentary about Kinshasa University to look at how far we've come uh, while we are even right now uh, headed to the promised land to become a premier uh, business and technology university of choice, uh, the whole of Africa, the whole of the world. There's a short documentary to help us to uh, look at how far we've come. Uh, this university started in, in around 1989 in a small room in uh, Westland. And uh, we have come a long way to where we are right now. You can spot uh, most of the uh, constructions, buildings there, uh, which are the ultra-modern library. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can enhance volume, the audio bit of it. I think there's a small challenge there. You know, we are living in the garbage in, garbage out era with the advancement of computers from uh, the various generations which we've come over time. But uh, 
uh, we, re we regret that uh, issue and uh, uh, we are going to take care of that next time. Uh, those are our students who are uh, participating uh, in various sporting activities, uh, both uh, nationally and internationally. We have our strate strategic pillars uh, which have been projected. That is our chill zone, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, the best in East Africa uh, right now. Uh, that is the entry to administration block, our beloved uh, Professor Isaiah Wakindiki, the Vice Chancellor, uh, giving uh, introductory remarks about the university. Uh, those are our students who are engaged in various uh, computer laboratories as part of the engagement, student engagement, and uh, ensuring that uh, we attain academic excellence as part of our strategic pillar. We are a technology university in addition to being a business university. That is why you are supporting a lot of uh, advancement in that area and a lot of uh, uh, build up in the in the computer, uh, computer laboratories. I think the volume is okay now. Kenya College of Accountancy, a company incorporated in the Republic of Kenya on the 11th of May 1989 as limited by guarantee. So in 1989 we were able to launch uh, the Kenya College of Accountancy in the support of uh, ODA, the British government support. Given my role in the Education Committee of ISPAC, I was then uh, appointed to the board of the college, uh, which was a college training accountants and uh, accounting technicians. The college started off the operations in July 1989 in rented premises at the Westlands area of Nairobi with an initial student enrollment of 179. Over the years, the college witnessed rapid growth in student numbers, necessitating relocation in 1996 from Westlands to a more spacious facility at Paramount Plaza in Gara area. The institution relocated again in 1997 to its current location at Ruaraka along Thika Road. The college applied and fulfilled all requirements of the Commission for Higher Education to be awarded university status. On the 1st March 2013, KCA University received its charter and has gradually increased the number of students. Enrollment currently stands at over 15,000, which includes students placed through Kenya Universities and Colleges Central Placement service. KCA University offers certificates, diplomas and degrees at undergraduate and postgraduate levels with effect from 26 July 2007. KCA University boasts of a modern instructional facilities and an ultra-modern library which seats 1500 and provides access to an extensive collection of books, periodicals, magazines and journals, audiovisuals materials and electronic databases. The Martino Duoro Tieno Library has an ill-built network link and reliable wireless internet that facilitates research and academic discourse on a global platform. To make campus interesting and memorable, the university administrations work closely with the Student Association of KCAU, SACU, to ensure all students feel part and parcel of all outside class activities. The students participate in a various sporting activities of their interests to grow their talents and special interests. Our strategic plan 2019 to 2023 projects four strategic pillars. A British Council report in 2016 in Kenya, Nigeria and Ghana ranks KCA as a top private university through a study on graduate employability. We will not be pursuing just numbers but we want to be pursuing quality aspects in whatever we engage in to make this a referral university. KC is going to be one of them. In the coming few years, this shall be a referral university in the Republic of Kenya 
and if possible in the region. Despite the COVID-19 related disruptions, we've remained focused and shaken and with the new face of leadership. We are an indomitable force that cannot be stopped. And to the great heights, KCA University, a premier business and technology university of choice. Thank you for that. I know at the right time, Mr. Joe Ageo will be officially talking more about our guest. I just want you to let, I just want to let you know that we have in the room, uh, Esther Koimet. Uh, Esther Koimet, when you talk about her, you look at a Kenyan investment banker who works at the Directorate General Public Investment and Portfolio Management at the National Treasury. Currently, she's the Principal Secretary at the Telecommunication Group, which is a big corporation uh, with a number of uh, companies therein, uh, about uh, 13 of them, of which we have eight being insurance companies, uh, especially incorporated in the Republic of Kenya. But this is a multinational corporation, uh, which uh, has got uh, representation in uh, five countries currently, in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, and Mauritius. I want to uh, just uh, welcome them and to request them to feel at home. At this, at this particular period of time, I want to uh, welcome our Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Finance Planning and Development, Professor Damiana Kieti, to come give a few welcoming remarks and then to invite our vice chancellor the rest of the program will follow uh, thank you uh, very much our vc and ceo uh, kca university professor isaiah wakindigi our today's guest speakers um mr joseph Mulei Muya, Director of Public Communication in the Ministry of Information, in the Ministry of Information, Communication and Technology, Dr. Julius K. Kimgetich, Jubilee Holdings Group CEO, Ms. Karo Kariuki, KEPSA CEO, CEO, our today's moderator, Mr. Joe. KCA University Management, staff, students, and alumni, good afternoon. Good afternoon once again. I know each one of us is looking forward to our today's speakers. And because I do not want to waste a lot of time on this, allow me to take this opportunity to welcome our CEO, our VC, Professor Isaiah Wakindigi to give us his remarks. So kindly, can we welcome him with a, a round of <laughs> applause, please. Thank you, Karibu, uh, Professor Wakindigi. So thank you so much, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor. I want to greet you, members of the distinguished panel today, Julius, Carol, Joseph, and the moderator, Joe Ageo, members of KCA University, in whatever rank you hold, whether student or staff, and the general public who are linked to our today's public lecture, good afternoon. Silence in the house. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I want to welcome you all in today's public lecture as we discuss excellence in public service as an enabler for business. May I take this opportunity to welcome our guests in a special way 
and to make them feel at home at KCA University where we pride ourselves as the premier business and technology university of choice as we advance knowledge and bring change to the world. In pursuit of our vision mission, KCA University's charter has mandated us to establish partnerships and linkages with the industry and to participate in educational conferences, seminars, workshops, in order to advance knowledge and bring change. Ladies and gentlemen, this mandate forms the basis of our public lecture series and in particular our public lecture today. Here in Kenya, uh, public lectures are not very common, especially among institutions that we classify as public universities such as ours. Maybe for some audience who may not know that in the 19th century, the popularity of public lectures was given by Sir Humphrey Davy at the Royal Institute, who was so great that the volume of carriage traffic uh, in the street caused it to become the first one-way street in London. The Royal Institute's Christmas lectures for young people uh, uh, nowadays also have continued to attract audience in televisions uh, and other outlets around uh, most of Europe. And lectures by Alexander von Ombot, uh, the great German scholar that he gave uh, at the University of Berlin in the winter of 1827 and 1828 formed the basis of later of his work that is popularly known as Cosmos and fathered or promoted this habit of public lectures. We started public lectures in this university just last year. Uh, the reason was to help our students and the general public who are our stakeholders to prepare for the market and to exchange ideas, knowledge, and news from uh, the market and from the academy in a two-way uh, kind of flow. To this end, we have been ranked in Google as a preferred university of accounting in this republic so far. Today's panel discussion will give us an insight of our institutions are positioned to offer comprehensive, independent assessment of issues and tap into resources that accrue from public service. I believe we will all be able to set objectives and activities that will ultimately contribute to Kenyan's development agenda and in turn advance our university in discharging its mandate. So let us keep the discourse. We thank you for supporting us, dear guests, and we will continue to work closely with your institutions to continue this series of public engagement. We also assure you that we will supply market-ready graduates. When you get the so-called not-so-good students out there, know that they are not from KCA University. And if you want to get market-ready students, Wherever you are, ask for market, uh, those who are coming from KCA University. Ladies and gentlemen, I now want to officially open this public lecture by inviting our moderator, our very own Fred, who we want to promote to be uh, an adjunct member of the faculty and any other position that he may so wish. Mr. Joagel is not new to us. I want to invite him. He is currently the uh, editorial director at the Nation Media Group to take up the panel discussion uh, for the rest of the program. Thank you so much indeed. Welcome, Joe.
doesn't appear that I can be heard. Oh, I can. Okay, I tend to be loud, so I just hope that. Uh... Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof, for those very kind rewards and very public offer uh, for me to uh, begin approaching KCA for uh, some other responsibilities, and I will take you up on that when we are done with this. All right, thank you very much. Uh, nearest to me, Mr. Joseph Mule Muya, who is a director of Department of Public Communications at the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. <laughs> Last but not least, Dr. Julius Kim Ngatich. All of you know him. Uh, he's currently the CEO, at group CEO, I should say, at Jubilee Holdings. Karibu sana. All right, so because our time is far gone, I will not uh, belabor the fact that uh, this is indeed an eminent panel, as you know by now. Uh, so I just want us to, to go straight to this discussion. Um, I know there is a huge online audience that is joining us and would like just to welcome you to be part of this conversation. And later on when we open the floor, uh, we will also be opening all those online channels so that we can have the same conversation. So this um, morning, I happened to be at a hotel, and um, I needed to have some documents printed. So I went, and uh, they showed me a business center. I, uh, I went there, and the computer was very slow, so I ended up taking a long time there. So when I went to the reception where they had said I could pay, then um, I said to the lady who was uh, there that, well, your computers are very, low, uh, very slow. Then she said, uh, they are not my computers, they belong to the hotel. <laughs> uh, and, and at some other time, if I wasn't going to sit with uh, my friend from government, uh, Wanamule, I would have said, that sounds like a government office. But this, <laughs> and I know a lot of people would have that, uh, that, that kind of impression. And maybe I will just start. We are doing well. I, I will just start with you. Uh, many people think. And I would, if anyone were to be honest in this room, many people would think about uh, public services or to go to any government office. The impression they would have would be someone who would say, uh, it's not me, it is, it is the government. Thank you, Joe. I, I hope you can hear me, eh? Yes, yes we yes. can. Yes, uh, like you've heard, uh, my name is Mulei. I want to assure my brother here, I am definitely not the PS. <laughs> Neither am I Esther. <laughs> I'm uh, stepping in for the PS. And uh, to some extent, uh, I understand where the, that perception is coming from. Because uh, government or other public service has been characterized by a lot of uh, lethargy, a lot of inefficiency, a lot of, uh, what, what, what is the right word? Um, a lot of incompetency. But as my big brother and mentor would uh, confirm, because uh, I don't know whether the VC knows that uh, Dr. Ari has done stints in both the uh, public and uh, private sector. <laughs> and uh, he, sets, he set quite high standards. We have evolved. As you can see, I am using a tablet. <laughs> I'm not using those desktop uh, computers. So I, 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 the government we have involved and uh, we are working on things. But uh, I would say it is more of a societal uh, issue. Sorry to use this example, but uh, we are told that we get the leaders that we deserve because as society that's what we. So similarly, uh, government serves the people for the people by the people and you know all that stuff. So we, 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 we are working on serving the people well, and uh, we have made very many uh, key milestones. Things are no longer the way they used to be. And, and, and we will come to that, including yes. uh, performance contracting. We will we'll try to understand how well that is going. But let me go to the private sector a little bit. And uh, Carol, it doesn't get more private sector <laughs> than you, because uh, you deal with all of private sector in this country. 
Um, when you hear this thing of public service, um, and, and usually there is, without government, the private sector has a problem. So from the private sector side of things, when you talk about public service in your relations with, with, with the, 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 the public sector, what is that? What does that really mean to you? So thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had some lunch. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So I'm really privileged and very happy to be here and discussing this very important topic because um, private sector are part of the public sector in terms of we are part of the public who consume government services. But for us, beyond just uh, consuming government services, the impact it has on business is very high. So the, the time it takes to start a business, the time it takes to transact, the cost associated with that, the processes that you have to go through to do business affects your ugali in the evening or your bread in the morning. Because what private sector will do, if the costs are that high, if the time taken, every t if I take two days to do something against one week, I add the cost of one week lost time as a cost to business. So the more efficient the government is, the more friendly the business climate is for businesses, both local and foreign. But secondly, the more cost friendly it is for goods and services for the public. Mm -hmm. So for us, the, so from where I sit as KEPSA, being an umbrella body, we engage with government as a critical stakeholder just to ease the, the business environment and make it more conducive so that we can have the end product that is cheaper. If the port of Mombasa is not moving efficiently and goods are stuck there for three months, the demurrage I pay as an importer, I'll pass it to the consumer. You know, if I'm, try I'm moving my goods from and what that takes. It also means if business feels that there is pain in Kenya, business is not um, altruistic in the sense that I have to invest in Kenya. You know, they'll move somewhere else where there's more efficiency. And so the loss is to all of us. No jobs, no revenue for government, and so, and everything else. Roads and everything else gets affected. So it's very important that government services are there to begin with, and then they're efficient. Well, th thank you. Do Dr. Kim Metich, uh, I know of uh, a U.S. Secretary of State, Jack, ja uh, Secretary of Treasury, Jack Liu, who once said that uh, there is no higher calling than public service in terms of a career because he said it improves, uh, it basically ch makes a difference in people's lives and improves the world. And as someone who has straddled both worlds, I mean, you have been in the, in, the, in the public sector and now you are here, so you basically have seen perhaps the best and the worst of both. But where do you see public service today and where would you say the disconnect is? Because there is an admission in this room, including from my friend Muya, that yes, there are steps being made, but we are not there yet. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, I agree with you that I've been to the two places, and I know at the highest level possible CEO of institutions, both in private and public. What I can say from the outset is um, when we talk about private sector and public sector, it is just a division of responsibilities. Remember, it's the same citizen, it's the same customer, it's the same client that we are serving, but from different directions. So when, I, when you are a member of the public, you are consuming, sometimes simultaneously, public and private services. And so therefore, we should not discriminate and say, oh, 
you are private sector or you are public sector. There has to be a symbiotic relationship between the two. Now, the, the challenge is how do we cleverly build a relationship between government and private sector? An institution like KEPSA is the umbrella body of the private sector in Kenya. Now, how does Carol engage various arms of government through structured forums so that then they can deliver services to the citizen? Now, as we, as we speak now, all over the world, it's the same world, is government is good at certain things and it should remain and be excellent in those things. Mm -hmm. And then private sector is very good at certain things. So the two of them must meet. Usually there will be a lot of argument on the boundary. There is nothing wrong with overlap, but there is always a, a lot of argument on the boundary or government privatize, move away from business, or some, some countries, you would be surprised that uh, government does business and does it excellently. So what we need, and uh, probably I'll talk about it later, Joe, is I've always advocated that the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, there is one missing. And that is why we fail in the MDGs the Millennium Development Goals. Because there's one goal that was never uh, paid attention to by the world. And if I ever get a forum, I will write a seminal paper for it. And I hope KCA will help me. <laughs> and this is clever government. We miss that. If you look at countries which have made a difference in the last 50 years, the central ingredient of those which have made huge leap in the last 50 years was clever government. The Singapore's, the South Korea's, the China's, the Dubai's, all of them had clever governments that was able to attract private capital and you saw the, the growth that they have been able to sustain. So, whenever you have a stupid government, the consequences are dire. Similarly, whenever you have a stupid private sector, the same consequences are obtained. So it's very important that as private sector is strengthening itself, it has to work very well with a clever government. The minute one falls, then you see the country beginning to struggle. Th th those are interesting adjectives you're using. I am <laughs> curious what, what a clever government looks like in terms of, 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 of public I can sector. explain in just a very short thing. A clever government is one which has one very strong leadership. Leadership is the single most difficult ingredient that is dragging Africa backwards. Just very strong leadership. If you look at the countries I've mentioned, the Liqua News, the the Deng Xiaoping. The central theme is strong leadership. The second one is that leadership then which means well for the people. Now if you have leadership that means well for themselves personally, you are cooked. So it must be leadership that is very strong but means well for the people. Okay? And then the next one, the number three, is not corrupt. The central theme of those countries which are dragging behind is, is plagued by corruption, which is people then see them, uh, government, as a place for personal aggrandizement, personal benefit. Similarly, if you go even to private sector, a company that is, is corrupt, it will fall by the wayside. And you have seen companies falling. And if you go to any of them, the central theme was poor governance. So it is very important that we have clever government, very strong leadership, means well for the people, clear vision for the people. And if with that clear vision, it includes attracting capital because it is private sector that generates employment. It's not government. Government facilitates and then private sector generates the employment. And voila. Look at, for example, Dubai. What did the Maktoum family do? In 1980, they were just a piece of sand. They have run out of oil or they had very little of it. So they asked themselves, so what do we do? This piece of sand, we can 
be a trading hub. So they asked them, okay, a trading hub at 46 degrees centigrade, average. How, how can that happen? Say, don't worry. Okay? A room can this can be cooled. So what's the problem? As we speak today, Dubai is the largest construction site on earth at 46 degrees. Now, the average temperature in Nairobi is 26. The most livable city in the world is Nairobi. But why is it not attracting the capital that Dubai attracts with that kind of temperature? Your guess is as good as mine. You are Kenyans and you know it. Okay? On others, nine, don't make another stupid mistake because you'll have a stupid government. Thank you. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. Thank God we are at, an, at a university. So, <laughs> okay, so, 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 Wanamule, this is very interesting because we are talking about uh, what government can do and you are beginning to explain certain things that uh, you, uh, you, the government has taken uh, steps about and, and, and progress that's being made. So for someone who has that image of a government where someone would leave the jacket on the seat and go away for two months and, you know, if you went there, they said, no, no, I'm a talker to Kidogo, he's just about to come back. What is that that you will say this afternoon that this is how we have moved from that government that you used to know to the one that is there today? Things have changed in the government. Even by the time... Uh my elder brother was living. <laughs> Things had changed for yes. the better. And uh, we have embraced uh, the performance contracting and result-based uh, management system, whereby it's no longer an issue of you come hang your coat, you go do your stuff. No. Everybody has their responsibilities, and you have you are expected within particular time frames to be able to achieve results. Because at the end of the day, it is just like in the private sector that you are rewarded based on your performance. Things are even changing. Most of the senior management now in government is on contract, including yours truly. You don't perform, too bad. Because two of PNP, permanent and pensionable, whereby even if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm still going to be around. But these days things are different. You have targets that you are expected to meet and they are cascaded from the highest level to the lowest level. For example, where I work, the person who serves me tea knows her responsibilities. As the HOD there have ensured that she knows her responsibilities. Therefore, if they are not met, because if I don't get a cup of tea at the time that I'm supposed to get a cup of tea, I'll most likely will get a headache. <laughs> it's going to disrupt my day. Then I will not be able to perform. And that will go down to the rest of the staff. There will be a knock-off effect whereby we will not perform. So similarly, uh, with the infusion of some good brains from the private sector, we have been able to change things for the better. The government has also taken its role uh, seriously that it needs to play its facilitative role more effectively. And I'm sure from the time that Caro has been at uh, KEPSA, uh, she can testify that things are... We are not yet there. Just like a country, we are not yet there. But we are moving there. Why? Because there's a new thinking in government that the public are our employers. All of us have people at home who help. So can you imagine, Professor, if you go home, you ask for a cup of tea, and the young lady tells you, Nichote Kwanza. We are all Kenyans, so I hope that language is understood. Pay me first. Give me something small. I am sure she will not even spend the, the night in that uh, place. 
So why do I ask for money or for something small from the same public member who has been taxed so that I can get paid? So even as we are moving away, and I'm talking about the civil service, we are moving away from being stupid, as my brother said. Because it's only a stupid person who will tell the employer, give me something. <laughs> wow. That is quite interesting. And I, I, I think we'll come back to the issue of, uh, of corruption, because he, he also mentioned that. But Carol, let me come back to you. One of the uh, sections of the business um, community that takes the government as, as, as a, and, and which is a, a big customer for, 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 for the government and vice versa, is the SMEs. And most of the conversations you hear is that a lot of them don't quite know what opportunities are there. They don't feel government in the right ways, that they're not getting all the information that they need, that that first the, the, the greatest share of, of employment in the country. So let me begin from where this uh, journey came from. And this is uh, both SMEs and large companies, but a lot to do with SMEs. When um, our former pr president, Moe Kibaki, was in office, one of the things, and as I said, we engage with government on a very structured uh, engagement, so it's not ad hoc. And uh, we raised the issue of um, if business is going to run well in this country, one of the things that we need to do is start looking at e-government. Because while a big corporate can employ all manner of lawyers and all people to run around to get services from government, an SME cannot do that. And assuming an SME will leave Northeastern or Western to keep coming to Nairobi for a service, that's really tasking an SME to do beyond and they cannot, and that's where we started seeing a lot of SMEs never surviving in, in terms of doing business. So the whole idea of e-government came from them, and the idea was to start digitizing government. Then um, the work began, and then came in the Jubilee administration, and we presented the same, and we presented it in a different way this time. We looked at the ease of doing business. The World Bank had a track of ease of doing business and, and rating countries that ended in 2020. And at that point in 2014, Kenya was at 136 out of about 180 countries. And we said, there's no way we can continue to do business this way. And so the president gave us a target. He said, by 2020, I want to see Kenya top 50. And so what we did ourselves, KEPSA, uh, the, the government, um, that time Ministry of Trade, and the World Bank, we formed a tripite. And we decided to go to every areas of government and seeing where the issues are and where we are rating. So there are 10 indicators in the ease of doing business. You know, uh, cost of starting a business, starting a, starting a business, um, ju the judicial issues, you know, all those different things that affect business. And we started tackling one by one. And I can confidently say in 2020, despite COVID, we were at number 56. So we actually did achieve our mandate. If COVID wasn't there, we would have been top, 20, uh, top 50. But what does that mean? How many of you have used Huduma Centers for any service? And because it's a public lecture, I am not lecturing, but allow me, Vice Chancellor, just to ask a few what service they got from uh, Huduma Center. What, what the service did you go for? Good conduct. This is a certificate of good conduct. Good service yeah. certificate. Another one? Lost ID. Lost ID. One more? Shop. You know, so that's what we started pushing and said, if government, government has to be available to the people and easily available, and we started pushing for one-stop shops. So we have the Huduma Centers as one-stop shop for all those services. Then for businesses, in terms of uh, registration and all that, we started reducing the number of days, the time it takes, and then we started a one-stop shop with Kenya Investment Authority. So that you, you go to Kenya Investment Authority, you find a KRA person, a KEBS person, all those different services, so that you don't move from office to office. That has served more the SMEs than even the big companies, because they are the ones who needed mostly where, where services can be comp compressed. But it has had a good impact to the, to the public. You know, today you don't have to go and apply for your driving license 
or file uh, by going to to uh, going out of your office you just go online your taxes i tax we looked at one of the areas that we are doing so badly as a country was the taxation you know compiling compliant to the taxation the time it took to do that we all now are using i tax in our businesses at individual level all that came from there and so for us that's what we have seen as where government has grown with us but it has meant continuous engagement with government and so on the sme back to your question so these have been good services for all of us, but particularly to the SMEs. We've even gone a step further with the counties now, because remember all businesses are in counties, and, and they need to apply for different licenses at the county level. Again, now that has gotten automated. So they need just to go online and see if I'm operating in county X, what do I need? And apply for all of them online. So the whole idea, as long as you can get internet, you have a smartphone, or you can, uh, you can get a computer, you can do so much more with government now than before, which has been good for business. So not only have we improved our ranking on the ease of doing business, but you've seen the impact that has had. You know, you walk around anywhere, you see any small businesses operating. You know, the last 10 to 15 to 10, uh, 10, 15, to 10 to 15 years, there's been a vibrant um, business sector. You know, so what now we are, we are working on is scaling them up so that they don't only operate at that level. We don't want Mamamboga to remain Mamamboga. We want them to move to the next level. And so that's where we are, working with all these entrepreneurs and trying to scale them up. But all that came from that government became easier to transact with. Your passports, your IDs, you know, a lot of work now you do online. You only show up to do, um, for those security documents, to do your, uh, what is it called? the identification because you need to go to the biometrics yeah. yeah again now we can do biometrics we didn't have all that so in terms of that for us we've seen a real improvement and all we're saying is uh, completing that whole process of uh, e-government digital what we're calling uh, digitized all government lands i know many of you have either your parents or someone has tried to um, look at their titles and everything. Now at least you can go online and find where your title is or if it exists or something has happened. So there's a process going on called National Lands Management System. It's not complete, but it's a process. But there's also been another side to this. You know, when you digitize, there are people who always do business where, broke, where there are broken systems. So you find sometimes a hue and cry by a certain sector, and I'll give this example because it's been in the, in the, in the, in the, in the open. The lawyers have not been very excited with how NLMS is going on the land sector because it's a loss of jobs. And we're saying, now you have to move and do business somewhere else, you know, because you're not going to lose the business completely. The more efficient the land system is, the more the lawyers will get business, but different areas, not the areas they've worked. Mm -hmm. So again, that's what we have to manage. Lastly, let me, let me just add this. We've had the same with the Port of Mombasa. You know, goods used to be stuck there for a long time. So during that, uh, the present Kibaki's time, we said, okay, it's impossible to keep the ships docked for this long to get the goods out. So why don't we start um, CFSs, container freight systems, that will be operated by private sector? And those were established, you know, and that made it easier because then you could move your goods out, put them in a container until you finish all your processes with the port, and then you can move your goods. But in the last few years, the port has really automated. It's become efficient. One of the things we realized at the port, there used to be about 12 agencies that you had to deal with as at the port. They've been reduced to four. But that has meant a lot of work from our side in advocacy and saying all oh, these don't need to be at the port and these services can be merged in this way. So that has made the port very, uh, very efficient. But who are crying? The CFSs. Because mm -hmm. now they lose the jobs. Yeah. So that's the other thing that we have to keep working. So sometimes when you hear uh, something being said, one, you need to ask, is it because something has become efficient that someone has lost some business? You know, and that's how we need to keep managing this so that government can become more and more efficient. Wow, Th thank you. Uh, I, I hope you are doing a recording of this because this, I mean, he's, yes, she's done a really good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 because I, I, I want to open this up a little bit uh, to, to our audience here and even the one online. But Dr. Kim Ngetich, let me just point out another area which many people see as a huge service failure, and that is the traffic 
germs that we see everywhere in this country. And I've had some estimates, uh, people talking about um, lost productivity as much as 50 million shillings a day, if it's not more now. Um, how do we... How do you look at this, first of all, from a business uh, standpoint in terms of the impact that it has, but also some thoughts about how to really go about this? Because it, at the end of the day, it has a real and direct impact on, 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 on cost of business and, and other related factors. Okay. Uh, even just before even I look at public transport, let me revisit again the role of government. You see, the role of government is to do common services, what is common to all of us. And then private sector does what is that is which is individual. So uh, if you look at our competitiveness as a country, I want to give an example of um, our EPZs. Our EPZs uh, have struggled to be competitive compared to, say, China, you know. And, uh, one of the drivers is wages. The average person in Kenya mm. working for an EPZ is paid more in dollars in Kenya than in China. Okay. And the reason why the one in China is paid less is because of availability of certain public services to these people. Mm -hmm. uh, they get, for example, subsidized housing, mm -hmm. subsidized transport, uh, they get water very cheaply, you know. Those services then are not available here. So if I am running a factory and I, I want the unions are demanding for higher wages, they are justified in that uh, the same person doesn't have that, those facilities that a Chinese has. So let me then use that to say, to use public transport as an example. Those of you who are old enough, and probably there are people who are old enough who lived in Nairobi in the 60s, the 70s, and the early 80s, we had, we had one of the most efficient public transport in the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Singapore's and the South Malaysia. Korea's came to see how it worked. Mm -hmm. So we had a Kenya bus which used to be on time, very clearly labeled where it is going, and if you go to a bus stop, say at Kenko, it was the schedule was there, and the bus arrived on time. So it's not that Kenya has not had or solved its public transport problems before. If you are, if you are going overland, it was OTC. I know some of these young people, you go to OTC bus stage and like, right, what does OTC mean? Okay? OTC actually was the equivalent of Kenya bus at going overland. So we had actually efficient public transport systems what happened along the way? We allowed then Matatus to come. Matatus was supposed to be a, a side show, but it's now the main show. And it is chaotic, as chaotic as it can get. So we need then to retrace our steps and say, we need the common services must work for Kenya to be competitive. The government common services. And we work together with private sector. Government must work with private sector to make sure that these common services are working mm -hmm. so that then private sector can concentrate on their own part. Then Kenya becomes collectively competitive. So we need the, I know government has worked on BRT, for example. Mm -hmm. BRT is working already in Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. So it's not something rocket science, it's something that can work. So we need very efficient common services, transport included, so that then, the private sector can reduce the pressure of wages because it is the biggest cost usually in a business which then makes Kenya non-competitive. And you want to make your country non-competitive, attracting then the members of KEPSA to come and provide jobs <coughs> becomes a difficult thing, becomes very difficult. And all these young people who are asking for jobs, they are not, they are looking at government. Actually, it's in the private sector, but government then provides the foundation which is enabling so that then those private people can come. Let me tell you, the world is not short of money. Our unemployment in Kenya is our own self-creation. If we create the environment, investors will come. As I told you, 
we have one of the most livable places on earth. Much of the whole of Kenya. But Nairobi is one of the most livable places on earth. Why shouldn't we be attracting investment? We need then to collectively look at how are we doing the common services so that then we are able to, the private sector people can come in large numbers and solve the unemployment problem. So our unemployment problem is something which is artificial and we can easily solve it by making sure that the foundation of the country is strong enough, again clever government, and so that investors can come in large numbers to interact with this clever government. It has worked in the countries I told you, the, the Singapore's, the Malaysia's, all these emerging countries, all of them were driven by a very efficient public sector which then private sector could engage. So there has been some work, but we need to move much faster because the rest of the world is moving much faster than us. So that is where the, the, the difference is. I just wanted to comment on something which uh, Carol talked about, SMEs, if you may allow uh, Joe. You see, if you look at, I used to be the CEO of Ken Invest. Uh, 2002, 3 and 4. And we did a lot of studies on what really made the Malaysia successful. And it is what they did in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, that has created a huge impact to today. If you look at, say, uh, Korea, what you, you see today as Samsung was a very small family company in textile business in Korea. What did the government do? It promoted the SMEs. What it did was, they were SMEs at the time, and then they came up with what they called the linkage strategy. The linkage strategy was they incentivized multinationals to trade with their own small companies. And the purpose was so that then they understand how multinational corporations work and raise their standards to global levels. So this was a company in textile. Today, it's in electronics as their core business, and is a global giant. What did they do? Private sector, working with their own government, creating the necessary incentives and environment, and look at where. They call them chai bowls, and you can Google the South Korea chai bowls. There were nine originally, they have grown. The Daewoo's, the Hyundai's. The LG. Yeah, so all of them you are consuming their services, but they were very small companies 50 years ago, 40 years ago. Today, so they work with their government, clever government, clever private sector, working together and ensuring that they nurture all these companies to what they are today. And that's really the core of our discussion today. If we have government and private sector committed to the country, we can solve all these unemployment challenges of Kenya. All right. Just allow me just to say something that, uh, just to add on what um, Julius has said, because I'm very, for me, I know from where I sit and I, he's talked about labor, and one of the things that we've, saw, we've seen as a high labor cost and making our labor uncompetitive is transport. So when I hear people talking about that we have a public transport, we don't. Matatus are my members. They are there to make profit. You know, so they are not public transport. We actually don't have public transport anymore. Boda Boda Association is my member. So we don't have public transport. So we need to end yourselves to really demand of your government that if you're going to have jobs and if you're going to be competitive in the labor uh, sector, we have to have public transport. So the, what um, Julia has talked about, BRT, which is bus rapid transport system, is a process and a policy that was put in this country in 2006, actually when I joined KEPSA. We're yet to see it actualized, you know, so there have been promises. But as I said, again, we have to realize what stops some of these things. And I said, I talked about the port. We've had the same challenge in the transport sector, where those benefiting in this broken system will not want that system. So it beholds all of us and you are students who are in this room, who the future is in your hands to ensure that those things get done by government so that you have a better future, you have jobs as you leave the university. And lastly to say, um, in terms of working for business, working with, with government, 
um, the areas of government whenever and now that we're in the election area, what should we be demanding of our candidates is the role of government. Government is not everything. Government has a specific role. If government focused on social services, as have been mentioned, it focused on health, education and infrastructure, business will move, jobs will be there. Don't demand anything else from government. Ask for those and make sure they're efficient. We are living in the digital era, in the technology. We can use so much technology to make those services efficient. Once they're efficient, then we'll be like everyone else who has moved from um, a developing country to a developed country. And we use the case of China. No country developed from a, what we call a third world country to a first world country, as fast as China, 30 years. It's not impossible, and especially in the age of technology. Well, do you want to respond to, and you've been taking some notes, because I want to open this to, to our audience. Well, I need, I, I need to thank both of them for <laughs> doing my job. Of, uh, but I wish to clarify that while government is there to facilitate you, you also need to be aware about the opportunities and play your role as a citizen of this country. One of your civic duties is coming in August. I leave it at that. All right, so let, let's get some, uh, some, some questions from the audience here or comments. I will also be getting a few from our uh, online audience uh, at, at the moment. So as we, as we pass the mic around, there is one actually already, and I, I think this would be fairly directed to one uh, Muya is saying, the image of customer, uh, customer service in the public sector is not as satisfying. What is the ministry doing to change that? So you can take note of that. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a... Uh... Okay, there is a question behind there. Okay, I do. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, my name is Gabriel Munene. Uh, I'm a member of the faculty here. So I've got two questions to Mulei from the government. So uh, of course uh, we know that uh, any major sustainable global city uh, definitely has got a robust metro transport system, be it a light rail or uh, the tube like in London. Now, what are the plans um, to install such a uh, system or a transportation uh, network which is not in the hands of the private sector or which is not uh, profit oriented in Kenya. Are there any such plans? Uh, my second question is um, every year we see the office of the Auditor General, they give qualified opinions about several uh, uh, um, government entities but uh, there is that issue of accountability. There is no one who Really is keen on uh, is keen of uh, on ensuring that co public resources are used prudently. Whether money is misused or not, no one really follows up things. And you see, like a county government, for example, they get accused of like stealing money and stuff like that. But uh, they are still in office. They are still running the show. So, what 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 is being done, or what can be done to ensure that? Um, uh, accountability, government held to account at both levels and uh, citizens are assured of value for their money. Th thank you. I think we can take uh, one more then we can have an some answers. Uh, thank you so much. I am Alex Ayakoveri from School of Technology. Currently, I'm practicing software development, and uh, I want to say thank you so much for our fosters and our guests for this uh, ambience. Uh, my question goes to Ms. Caroline. Uh, we, we, we acknowledge the, the presence of the private sector and the technology that we, we can see. We, we like what you, you are creating for us, but we, we feel like there are a little more we need to do. So for us to, to acknowledge that and be in a position to, 
to be able to create what is better than what is available now in the future using technology. How are you like, uh, capturing the attention of students? Thank you. Okay. Um, what was yes. the first one? Remind me. There, there was the first one that came from uh, the, our, our online uh, audience, the image of customer service in government and how you improve that. This person is... Uh, being uh, very gentle, saying it's not as satisfying. <laughs> and I'm sure he's not talking about the image in terms of uniform. But uh, the image is in terms of uh, the perception that... The perception, uh, yes. Government workers just come and hang quotes. Yeah. I've told you that uh, we have uh, moved into the performance contract uh, and result-based uh, system. And is that uh, across government now? Is that is now, yes, that is now. Before it was with the state agencies, uh, as uh, my elder brother would, con would confirm, but now it's moved into central government, if I can use that word loosely. And it has even been uh, cascaded to the counties, whereby it is we expect to get value for your money. It is good for you to know that the constitution, which is now 12 years old, because it was promulgated in 2010, has the Bill of Rights for the citizens. You have a right to walk into a government office, ask for services, and if you are not satisfied, you can raise a concern without any recriminations. How many people here have ever visited the office of the ombudsman? Even online, you see, civic duty. Recently, they went online. You can complain as you sit there that Mule is not telling you the truth. <laughs> I'm just using it as an example. As we sit there, you can complain on your phone to the Commission of Administrative Justice, and they will ensure that they will follow up. Just the same way we have a power that follows up on complaints against the police. Number two, we are also retooling, reskilling, and reschooling our staff to know that the customer comes first. And here, for the government, the customer is the public. As you have heard from my sister Carol, the government is engaging with its own citizens more so that you can get to know. I can only know what you require if I have a listening ear. I'm ready to hear what it is that you want. Then I can also do what? I can offer services based on your needs, not what I think you need. I hope I have answered. There was a second question on uh, the public transport system. I do not need to belabor what my fellow panelists have said, that it is true that private interest overtook public interest. Because even the law says clearly that public interest or the public good should always override private good. But just look at the case of SGR. Forget about those other issues of uh, that we are supposed to float the contract and stuff. Carol here will tell you it has, SGR has done wonders in terms of moving people and goods cost effectively. But who owns those lorries that need to carry uh, the containers which the SGR can carry? It is the private sector. It is us. And when I mean private sector, I'm not talking about Caro, I'm not talking about uh, Daktari here. It is us. Why? Because the law allows me, isn't it? But the moment you let your private interest overtake the public interest, that's when you get the problem. So if anything that is against my small kiosk moving, I will 
rally against it. But if we put the public interest before, so many visits, so many studies have been done. People have gone out there to see how things are done. A lot of papers have been done. But we can see a lot of changes being done. And so there's a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, please pay, play your civic duty starting on, in August and even now. Raise those issues. Every other day, if you look at today's newspaper, you will see a lot of counties advertising for public participation. But I can assure you, today, Machakos County is holding a public participation on the finance bill for that county. If I make a call now, because I'm from there, I can assure you there will be very few people. And it is right there in the middle of the town. Now, whose fault is it? I'm not saying that the county government there are saints. But if the people don't put checks and balances on them, then complain later. I hope you get my point. Then we have the issue of uh, corruption, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, and, and accountability, yeah, that's what's And accountability. We have seen cases where in the court of public opinion, so-and-so is guilty, isn't it? They are arrested with a lot of fanfare, taken to court. Joe and his colleagues soon will wait for the next one to come. And the interest dies down. So what happens? And we having that conversation right now, why some people should be barred from running. Isn't it? Because according to the courts of public opinion, Mulei was found with his hand in the cookie jar. It was a clear-cut case, according to people. But there is a judicial process. It is the people with a lot of money who can hire the best lawyers. There's a lawyer now who is about, there are some lawyers who are outshining Joe. Because apart from speaking in court, they come outside and become commentators, isn't it? Talk about this case and stuff. The CJ has just uh, issued rules saying that uh, lawyers should not discuss cases. We thought we knew something called subjudice, but now it's turning out to be something else. She has been sued by a lawyer for that. Yes. Exactly. So my, my, my point is that we have several arms of government which need to all play their role effectively so that we can get results. But I know the wheels of justice are surely turning, albeit very slowly. The other day we saw some uh, guys who were convicted uh, for a matter 16 years ago at NSSF. So the young people don't think that uh, if you do something now and uh, you will hang around, even by the time you're as old as Mule here, 53 years, the law will still catch up with you. But things are moving. All right, thank you. There was a question there for, 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 for Carol uh, about uh, technology uh, and, and also the, the role of students. And I would expand that and say what you see as the role of institutions such as this, um, institutions of, 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 of higher learning as such as this, in terms of contributing to this conversation but also finding solutions. So thank you very much. That's a very good question. We used to have a program we used to run, which I was trying to remember the name, and it was a partnership between the universities and private sector. We used to have it with, uh, between the universities and KEPSA. And the idea was to see how we work together on innovations, research and innovations, and be able to share that and see how we bring private sector to be able to buy, to commission research innovations which they can consume. And that, um, I think it's something we need to revive. But uh, for me, I think that partnership, the way we partnered with government to resolve some of these challenges, it's important that we partner with academia and look at the area of uh, R&D, the whole research and development, and especially innovations, and especially technology. And so that uh, a lot of our businesses consume a lot of research, a lot of innovations, from outside, because those people work together, the, the businesses and the, and, and the academia, and then they produce that. And so on an everyday basis, 
businesses are trying to grow and to grow they are trying to come up with innovations so we would like very much and uh, maybe I'd, I'd push this to the vice chancellor as part of the things we can do quickly is KCA to partner with ourselves and we see how we can start doing that and bringing in the, the businesses but for you as students as you're learning and you're in this innovation space you know, when we look at all the greatest innovations were not done by people in their late 40s and 50s and 60s. They were done by young people, many times in their garages, many times in their college rooms. Work on those innovations and the world will buy. The world hungers, private sector hungers for innovations, you know. And so if you come up with any small solution, you'll be surprised how much marked up it is. And there you get your niche, you know. MPESA that we celebrate today was an innovation by a young person, you know, so there's no limitation. And that opened a whole field of us being able to use innovations. Some of the challenges we're talking about, inefficiencies in, the, in a growing country, can be resolved by a lot of innovations that are here today. And I'll give you another example. Last 2020, in the height of COVID, one of the challenges was that um, pregnant women could not access hospitals because of curfew. Again, a young student in the University of Nairobi came up with an innovation that could help us identify this, um, the, the, the pregnant women and uh, could access through that innovation transport. So what did we bring from Kepsa, Kepsa side? We brought two things. We brought, we brought a transport, which was Bolt, he agreed to work with us. Remember, they are uh, an, um, an IT company uh, in the transport sector. And then we had a, 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 a 24 uh, calling line. So they could use our line to access Bolt and then Bolt would pick them. And we're able to do that for five counties. You know? And so those are innovations that came out. Today, that lady, Esther, for, I'm trying to remember, Esther Karaoke, is celebrated world over. I think just last year, she went to one of the countries to receive a big award for such an innovation. So there's no limit. Look and say, there's a gap here. There's an inefficiency here. Develop an app, develop an innovation that solves it, and then get to your university. So University of Nairobi contacted us because of that innovation, and then we worked together to use that innovation. So you can do that and utilize your own university if you're not able to reach businesses and say, I have this innovation. I think it can solve this particular problem. You know, and then get your university to work with us and we'll be able to at, um, link you with the businesses and that can move and you build your career from there, but you solve a challenge. I always say um, the, the people who make the, the greatest impact in the world, the people who make the most wealth in the world are the people who don't focus to look for how much money they can make. They look at solving a problem in the world. Because it's in that process that you become wealthy and you get, become the greatest. All innovations we consume, the light and all that. Someone was solving a problem, you know. And here we are, consuming it today. It solved a problem, but they became the greatest people that we, we, we know today and celebrate today. So, and that's my challenge to you young people. Think of the problems the world faces. And now you have the world on your fingertips because of technology. Solve a problem and you become the next you know the names. Can I add something yes. on that? Uh, actually, the, the, the foundation of a university, I think 14th, 15th century, their definition, the definition of a university is to solve societal problems. That's the definition. So, KCA University and all universities must <coughs> focus themselves and say, how are we solving societal problems? Now, if you look at the two core functions of a university, it is research and teaching. But research comes first. But in Kenya, we have tended to put teaching first. So we need to reorient universities and say, your core is to research first, to solve societal problems. Now, engagement with private sector should be <coughs> We have this knowledge, okay? And I would like KCA to come to Jubilee Holdings, for example, and say, okay, we seem to see this is your problem. We have this solution, pay for it. So I would like KCA University and all universities to start thinking of 
What is your equivalent of Silicon Valley? What's your equivalent? Okay? And remember, this is something which is 60 years old. Start. But the journey begins with one single step. So, if it is said tomorrow or next year, what will be your first step in creating the KCA Silicon Valley? Okay? And it could be virtual. It may not be even if you have physical space. It could be a virtual Silicon Valley. And then say, okay, guys, private sector, bring your problems. We are a university. We have young people. We have all these bubbly ideas. And so what are you going to do? So for us, as say Jubilee, for example, we are in the process of forming a digital factory. Digital factory means people can come, connect with us online or physically. We'll create a space. And young people can come, give us ideas, and then we interact. And in, through that interaction, if there is something that, is, that comes out of it, we register it as intellectual property, we will know your contribution, and we compensate you for that innovation, and we scale it up because we have the capital and the institutional framework to scale it up. So that is the symbiotic relationship I was talking about between government, where you are a public institution, and private. So private and public working together, but you need first of all to reorient the university to research first, and then teaching second. Yeah. What, what about the question that in other places you see a lot of corporates, um, I mean, the, 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 the really wealthy ones, one, one would say, or sometimes even uh, private individuals, um, basically helping to deal with the financial question, um, you know, in setting up endowment funds and those sorts of things that then help in scholarships and research and that sort of thing. Um, that doesn't happen here a lot. I don't know what your perspective would be where the missing link is. The, the missing link, Joe, is uh, public policy. You see, that's why I'm saying clever government. You see, <laughs> governments must look at it as an opportunity and say, yeah. Yeah. we have this pool of young people, mm -hmm. but they need to be engaged with private sector, even still at the university, as interns and the rest. Then if I was the Minister for Education, I would then say, what should be the public policy? Okay, which is translated then to legislation. I go to parliament, mm -hmm. I get it as legislation, and it could be a raft of tax incentives. It could be a raft of, you know, uh, some, something that rewards private sector for welcoming these people. So again, we need very vibrant parliament that can see that as opportunity and drive through legislation, which then creates the framework where then private sector can engage universities or any other institution to drive it. So, in fact, uh, it, it brings me to one of the things that, uh, one of the mistakes universities are making in design of the curricula. For example, when you design the MBA program, at the University of Nairobi originally, it was called Master of Business and Administration. But you guys uh, cut off the and. The and and you call it Master of Business Administration. So you just remain with Business Administration, but originally it was actually a marriage of the two, public and private. Mm. So I know if I, if I look at your MBA certificates, I'm sure it reads Master of Business Administration. Actually, it should read Master of Business and Administration. So it was bring the two together, and that was the original logic. But uh, it was lost along the way because people never understood why. So. It was to create uh, scholars or people who have knowledge of both private and public sector because you transcend both. People like me have transcended both. But because I came with that background of master of business and administration. And we, in our MBA program, we did a lot of admin, public administration things. One of our, our topics was actually public policy. Yeah. All right. Joe. So, 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 Joe. Yes. If I can take the cue from him. Eh? Yes, yes, please. The government has already become smart. How many of you know about Ajira? Yep, that's our program. The young guys? <laughs> yes. How many here in this room? Good. You know the import of Ajira? Yeah. Is to empower 
It was meant to empower over one million young people yeah. to access digital job opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it was to prepare the young people for, more, for the private sector to tap. And it is free of charge. Mm -hmm. What other thing do you want? <laughs> I rest my case. Okay, what other question do you have? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's is, there is one over there. Let me see a couple more hands so that when we come from there, we come straight. <coughs> um, wait, are there ladies in the room? Yeah? Is there a general ban on ladies speaking... Uh, in the audience. Okay, any any ladies who would like to ask questions? Okay, let, let's hope that we'll get a few. And uh, probably they might be online, the ones who are posing questions. Now, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, the last point which uh, Muley has just brought, I, I think many people do not have the information. They do not have that information. They keep on looking uh, for various opportunities, but they do not have that information that they indeed are there. Dr. Kim Ketich uh, mentioned about uh, Korea, which uh, sometimes uh, I, I looked back and I found that in 1964, Kenya issued a loan of $10,000 to Korea. But within three years, it came out of that state was able to repay the loan, and after five years was able to be listed among the Commonwealth nations. And I'm happy that uh, my question has been, how did they manage? I'm happy to hear that they managed through enterprise. Uh, there's a famous quote uh, that the ability to learn faster than our competitors becomes the only competitive advantage that we can have. I'm happy the Kenyan government has been able to formulate a number of uh, policies which are able to help uh, the private sector to thrive, but the critical condition is about the implementation. Like when you look at online, uh, you go to immigration department, you find that they have indicated the lag time for you to get a, a passport is 10 working days, but uh, you'll follow up a passport for three months, probably. And if even you find that people are applying for the passport from out of Nairobi are able to get it more faster than the ones who are applying it from Nairobi, uh, what can be done to ensure that we implement the formulated policy to ensure that we are able to uh, now be able to take advantage of them and be able to promote uh, the business environment? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Roger Sabongo, an employee of KCA University. I just want to really say that I'm glad by this conversation. More so, when I had issues about scholarships and endowment, you realize that uh, in this case, CAPS and government can really drive a very serious agenda where you give tax incentives that would motivate the private sector to give back to society. And I think that's one thing that really should be um, taken up now that uh, the three of our panelists here sit at policy uh, levels. I think that's one thing that I would want to encourage. But, but to Caro, I have a general feeling that the government um, sometimes uh, sets up certain systems not to work the way they should. I'm, I'm, I'm just deliberate by not directing this to Mulay. <laughs> uh, why do I say this? If you look at the transport sector, definitely, you go to Tanzania, let's not go very far. Go to Tanzania, you'll realize they have a very robust transport system. Go to Kigali, you realize that they have a very good uh, public transport system. So I have a general feeling the government really sets up uh, certain what they want to work will work, what they don't want to work for sectarian reasons may not work. So my question on that, what would KEPSA uh, want to uh, do to drive this agenda? For example, in health, why would you have government officials being paid for insurance to go to private 
facilities, for example. Yet we have government facilities that are in, in a very sorry state. My second uh, question is to uh, Mule. Um, when we talk about wastage in government, and I want to give the most recent example. A member of parliament, I will not mention names, but is in public domain, uses a CDF vehicle to go for campaign. And the level of impunity goes ahead to brand. Now that's just a tip of the iceberg. We find how many government officials take government vehicles for private use, by and large, and even carry along, uh, you know, several staff with them uh, to, uh, you know, uh, public functions, so, I mean to private functions. So what, in your own honest view, Bwana do you think uh, the government should take? And finally, in terms of behavior, uh, Joe Ageo says something, and I want to repeat this, that, you know, you, 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 um, you blame the mongoose as you blame the chicken, right? It's a common saying in one of our communities. So the chicken wandered out in the field. Why did the chicken have to wander away? And why did the mongoose have to do the dishonorable? So I think that as citizenry, we have also failed in our responsibility because we celebrate mediocrity. When one does the wrong thing, we seem to be pulling all the reasons why we are not, you know, the other party is also doing it. So why is it only on? on one side. So I, I and, and that's why when Mule talks about public participation, it's better said than done because they have been reduced to mere uh, you know uh, rituals that have to be carried out because sometimes decisions have already been made. At least this is the perception. But I want to agree when when Dr. Julia said that it is the populace that have to make a deliberate decision and the ship can only have a fellowship as a leader. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question uh, online to Dr. Kipnetich. They're saying that uh, Jubilee uh, has been around for, for quite some time and still withstands competition. So this person wants to know what are you doing differently and perhaps looking for lessons that can be drawn uh, for, for the public sector. Okay, so probably let me ask, answer that as the first one. Uh, Jubilee it, uh, Holdings, the owner of the insurance companies, is to, this year 85 years old. So it was formed in 1937 and still standing today. Okay. Is that what does good governance mean in reality? Good governance means a series of good decisions over generations. Because I'm here today, there were people who started in 1937, but the tradition of good decision making has been uh, one of the things that Deng Xiaoping said in 1984 was doing business is good. What they were trying to do is they were trying to push government further away and allowing private sector to occupy that vacuum. And they did it very cleverly. And China has managed to remove 800 million people out of the 1.4 billion out of poverty. It's a series of good decisions. And if you look at the, how the Chinese Communist Party uh, allows brilliant guys to go at the top, it's a very interesting, just go and study, because Google is there today, study how the Chinese Communist Party allows the brilliant to emerge in public service. The current president is an engineer, one of the top engineers in the country. And what are they thinking of? They are thinking of long term. If you look at their strategy on uh, Silk and Road, they actually have a framework, they have established a framework that will drive China for the next 300 years. So what they are doing just is just in blocks. Just like we had Vision 2030, then they are looking at 300 years and how their country will dominate the world going forward. And they, if you look at the way they are playing their game, they are slowly reducing America, America's influence. So it, everything is strategy and how you execute the series of decision making to formulate a strategy 
and execute the same strategy and moving forward. So one of the things that uh, probably, I, before I give my colleagues, my pet topic, and uh, I get very upset when people don't do this one, uh, because it applies both to private sector and public sector, which is aesthetics. Most of, I mean, most of the professors here probably have gone to universities abroad, and the first thing that strikes you about any university is aesthetics. How the loans are manicured. So I look at your your playing field, and the grass is not sufficient. And I want to challenge the university to work on the aesthetics. When that establishes a mind frame of excellence in the students, so it goes beyond just what you see visually. It also goes to facilities internally, the toilets, its work. Why is the roof leaking? You know basic things that is the mindset these young people take to the workplace that excellence is not just by accident it is the way we form their minds in school primary school secondary school university by the time they come to the workplace they have been framed that excellence is something good so to answer your question excellence is not something that comes by accident it is nurtured. It is, you know, it is shown by example. So that by the time the child then reaches that level of discharging duty, both in private and public sector, they are in that clever state. And so therefore, they do the thing with excellent signature. Okay? I mean, I was influenced significantly by the school I went. I was in Stare. And if you enter study, the first thing that strikes you is aesthetics. And that has, this, has then formed my mind to what it is today. So I'm urging you at the university level that let no student pass through your gates on graduation day with a mindset of grass is not grown or is not cut, flowers are not attended to, toilets don't work, lights don't work, roofs are leaking. If they go with that mind frame, they will be successful citizens. Thank you. Okay. So let me respond and I'll just maybe start from uh, where uh, Julius has stopped. When you look again back to the Chinese uh, model, and I think it's because it's a model that a lot of us are studying because of how transformative it has been in a very short time in that sense. Forget everything else, but in that sense. Um, because they focus on what is called meritocracy, you know, and that's why um, for me, again, because we have an opportunity as we move into our election cycles that we are looking at meritocracy, you know, the person who is speaking the loudest or the, uh, saying the, the sweetest words is that are they qualified for the job they are seeking and I guess that's the same thing we do in the private sector. When you come, however sweet you will talk, however nightly you've written the your, your document, that's not what I'm looking for, is that are you qualified for this job? And I think that's what we need to do for this country. If we are going to get government to give the services as we want it to give, we also have to have leaders in government who are there through merit, not uh, through popularism and all that. And uh, I think to the advantage of those governments like China who can think 300 years ago, uh, 300 years from now, sometimes our minds are close to the five-year cycle. You know, so we forget we even have a Vision 2030. How many know we only have eight years to the end of Vision 2030? Are we actually holding our own government and ourselves, you know, and looking at are we, where have we achieved? So we have done some things very well, some things we've not done very well. But the report card should be coming from us as a citizens. Where have we failed as citizens in the Vision 2030? Because it's our vision. And where has government failed in carrying the vision of the country so that we get, we, we get our, our minds outside the five cycles. Five cycles will never deliver the services that we are looking for. You know, those services come over time. You know, and uh, it's the same thing like what, what I was saying, what part of the role of government, infrastructure, a road built today will not deliver for you tomorrow. An SGR will not deliver. But it's 20 years, 30 years, 100 years. You know, and that's a mindset we need to have, the long-term mindset of what we are looking for. But going back to the question that was asked about incentives, 
you know, the very interesting, around 2015, 2016, or 2016, 2017, I forget a bit, um, in our usual structured engagement, in our roundtable with the president, he called for a specific roundtable on this whole youth and jobs. And what we presented to him was actually to say, um, if you give incentives to private sector, because sometimes I don't know you, I don't know who is Mary, I don't know who is John, but if Mary comes and does an internship in my organization, my chances of keeping Mary than going to look for Susan is higher. You know? And so what we did, we said, then can we have a tax incentive on internships? And we came up the policy. It's actually a government policy. It's just not been implemented. What that will allow is that there will be certain um, tax incentives given to companies for the number of interns. And we had actually capped for 10 and above so that you don't go for an incentive by just getting one intern. You know, you go for at least 10 interns, 20 interns. And um, I'll give you another example. When we ran a big program called Kenya Youth Empowerment Program, 2010, 2014, uh, with the Ministry of Youth and the World Bank. It was focused on actually on internships. So would get young people with high school or college and were more geared to the high school because we felt they're the ones who needed that most and place them to the different companies. The success rate of that program was that what we saw of the, of the two things that happened to those young people Many were absorbed in those companies as employees after that. There were three things. The second, others left and felt they wanted to advance their education because now they had experienced the work market and felt they had certain skills they needed and so went back to school. The third category went and started their own jobs, uh, own, own businesses, because they had gotten some skills of six months that they felt they could start something. Mm -hmm. you know? And for me, that's the things we should be thinking about. Those kind of programs, we're happy to work with government and other, and other partners like we did with World Bank. Ajira, the way we, uh, it was mentioned, we're doing it's digital and digitally enabled jobs. We're saying the work of brick and mortar is changing. You know, Today you can do jobs here from here to Australia to the US without having to relocate, you know, and on all those costs and just being online. But do people know how to use the online platforms? And that's what we're training young people to understand how to use the online platforms so that they can access those jobs that are being put up there by Upworks and others. We even have a Najira app so that you can access those jobs locally and abroad. But finally is that, yes, we need more policies around that, not only if First, we implement the internship one, but also even the work, uh, the one on innovations and research. If we could do that, business is willing to do more and to partner more and to absorb this. But you asked the last question. You said, you know, and you gave the example of Tanzania, which again had come up on the BRT. And the, when you say the bus rapid transport system, it includes trams and trains and all that. And we've seen government trying to move to do the problem with a, democr a democracy like ours. Sometimes you have to do things in, in bits and pieces because the sabotage is high. So we've been seeing the government trying to revive the old trains in, in Nairobi, the circuit, uh -huh. you know, and starting from there. You've seen the BRT line that has been created on Thika Road. Hopefully that will be implemented without a more sabotage. But our biggest problem is sabotage, you know. And as, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as government uh, mentioned earlier, is that even me who is trying to create that policy, I have an interest because I've been doing business. And so I sabotage the system not to work. It's not that systems are created not to work. Systems are created to work. Is that they're sabotaged by individuals who have personal interests. And that's what we need to fight for as citizens. When we know these things are good for us and we see they are not working, we push hard. Individuals cannot um, be a louder voice than ourselves. And so when individuals realize you're pushing hard, they'll let those things work. And so your voice as university students is what needs to be heard more, you know, and say so this is an important direction government is going to, it's to benefit us, to be able to have a livelihood and to have jobs. We want it to work, and so that individual interest keep getting removed. So right now you should be fighting for BRT, you know, and making sure that it works and works well. You know, you should be fighting for a better business and uh, environment so that we c investors can come and invest more. My vision is to have at least an, indus an industry in every constituency. So if we had an enabling environment, if there's no sabotage by politicians, and we got those, you can imagine the tr how transformative they will be to all of you who come from different constituencies. You know, 
Yes, we have jobs that are there. We want the border borders. They're important to us. They link us in many things. But would create more jobs so that everyone doesn't think, I just have to end up here or I have to end up here, you know, and create uh, and those linkages and all that. So that's, those are the things that I think as a, we, uh, government does its role with the citizens, including myself from private sector, with the private sector. I'll push for the private sector investments. I'll push for an enabling environment. But the louder voice should be the citizen's voice. Okay. Let me just add something on that. Uh, on citizen voice. <coughs> now, there are two arms of government which sometimes pretend as if they are not government. I think they look at the executive as government. the government. Mm -hmm. And then them, they are outsiders. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest policy driver yeah. is actually parliament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, our parliament has not been as effective mm -hmm. as it should be. Mm -hmm. Ideally, the a parliament at world class level is supposed to deliver 50 bills in a year. Ours actually delivers 50 bills in five years. So efficiency of parliament in espousing public policy mm. is something which we, we need to ask. And it goes to who are you actually electing to parliament? Mm. Yeah? Uh, there has been an attempt uh, through the new constitution to try to put some minimum qualification. A judge the other day said it can be anybody. And it, it will take <laughs> generations to undo that decision. Okay? So I was very disappointed. So we need to ask ourselves, are the judiciary and parliament seeing themselves as government? They drive GK cars, but they don't see themselves as government. Okay? Sometimes even members of parliament complain about public debt. Who approves uh, finance bill? It's parliament. Yeah. Who approves the, the debt ceiling? It's parliament. So when they complain as if they are a citizen out there, you wonder, you know, the role of parliament is legislation and oversight. They, they don't do that oversight role. So public policy fails on that account. So, and the judiciary, sometimes they, 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 they misuse a word, which uh, I don't know, they picked it from somewhere, call independence. Independence is defined mm -hmm. in relation to judgment only. Yeah. That they can make a judgment without any influence from anybody. And it stops there. Otherwise, they are part of the governing process. If, for example, they delay a judgment, what happens to the private sector? Mm -hmm. They go to, they move capital to another country. So, they need to see themselves as they contribute to an unfair business environment as the judiciary. If you don't deliver a judgment and you delay it for two years, which capital waits for two years for a judge to make a decision? Capital will look for the other 200 countries in the world. So they need to see themselves as part of espousing public policy. Mm -hmm. And that becomes, and then the final one is civil society. Okay? Civil society is a citizen organization. Our citizens organize themselves to demand for services from all arms of government. Now, there was civil society that was fighting for the new constitution. That came. Now, they got lost after that. They need to reorganize themselves and address that question, which I think uh, you mentioned about implementation. We need to hold institutions to account. And I think Mulei put it pretty well. We have the office of the ombudsman. How are we putting pressure enough for them to, where if the police misbehave, how are we putting pressure on a poor to investigate their own people and bring them to book? So citizen organization also needs now to take center stage and say, are the citizens playing their role in putting their government to account? Thank you. All right. Uh I, th I think we'll come to, to we we'll have to go to the government, at least this arm um, <laughs> that is here, because I mean the definition of government has been quite narrow from what Dr. Kimmich is saying, in, even in the minds of many people. Mm. And by the way, when those parliamentarians say those things, we clap for them. Yeah. Mm. So I, I would like us to bring this to a close very shortly. So please, your intervention, and then we'll have the last comments here. I, I okay. really am I'm, I'm sorry, I know that uh, many opinions, many views, many questions, but uh, as you clearly can tell, 
and we could discuss this all night, right? Okay. I'll pick up from where Dr. Ari has mentioned. If you look at that case of the MP, we heard about it when action had already been taken. I am happy that action is being taken. We have a number of cases of corruption or abuse of office or misuse. A junior officer who earns 20,000 has a house in Runda. The two don't match. Part of it starts at home. Do you know a lot of us are bribing our children? If you pass grades well, I'll give you this. What do you call that? Incentive. It's corruption. Incentive. Incentive. No. <laughs> not in the way it's put. The child should <laughs> not should know that they should do that. well because their future depends on it. Not because you will buy them this or you will give them this. Okay? And if you don't, they create a ruckus. Now, the point that you raised, the way sometimes I look at it, we got a new constitution. Do you remember when President Kibaki came into power? Passengers were arresting policemen who were taking five, fifty bob. We were declared the most optimistic, optimistic people on earth. What happened to that optimism? What happens these days? You arrest Mulei and all the cows follow Mulei to Integrity Center. What are you saying? Okay, we know they are paid. But I mean, it's a societal problem that needs to be, it's just manifested in the public sector. And especially in those two houses that our brother has talked about. If there is impunity that has a face, you know where it is. But we all need to work on it. Number two, we seem to have promulgated a new constitutional dispensation. But we didn't change our mindsets. We are still doing things the old way. If we did do a small survey here, there is what is called the Bill of Rights. If we ask how many people here read BBI from cover to cover, and this is a university, <laughs> it will be on the lower side. We need to play our part. We have changes that have come in, technological changes. For the better, the government and quite a number of uh, uh, partners have taken up new technologies. But the mindset needs to be start from the mind. The most important human resource. If there were no students here, Professor, you would not be seated here. If there were no workers in government, there would be no government and vice versa. It is the mindset that we need to change so that you do not have cases like those. There is uh, an audit we did with uh, some of our colleagues uh, because we look at uh, websites and uh, the uptake of online uh, technology in the government. And you'd, we went to immigration. All the systems are there for somebody to approve and do everything online. They would rather do it manually. That is why you get those discrepancies. Because these days, I am told that uh, the KCSC, the, the results that were released the other day, so they were done only. Mm -hmm. It cuts out that bit of, I have to read. Dr. Julius gave me a teach. Dr. John Mutua, let him you. But when it's online, you don't have that. So we still have a challenge of the people, the software, okay? Number two, there was, you raised the issue of uh, our facilities. There was a governor who was uh, trolled on uh, Twitter. You are telling us to go to those facilities and you have just come from abroad <laughs> before Corona. He could not trust his own health facilities. We still have that discrepancy. And am I allowed to do my... Wait, wait. Is this job and is this one? Which one do you want? <laughs> I kept quiet. Ah, where Now, I want to speak to the young people. 
<laughs> if those of you and you can go online check out the many times he has talked what he has just told you is very very consistent the bible says cleanliness is god next to what godliness, godliness. the young people i want to talk to the young people because this is a university there are three things that are very dear to me number one is called attitude if you have the wrong attitude it doesn't matter where you are you're going nowhere number two and that is what the university is doing right now activating your aptitude either it is latent in you or you are provided with the requisite skills but above all you must be passionate I run the factory that makes communicators for government a directorate called public communication but we you you expect somebody who has gone to several of the universities known how to become a communicator but at the end of the day they have no passion at one time there was a discussion in parliament where is the personometer <laughs> because some guys were appointed to the anti corruption body and uh, during the interviews they had no passion they were very lackluster you must be known for something there's a british author who said an educated person must know everything about something and something about everything we all know that it is the silly season right now in kenya isn't it but you should also know that my new my team is doing badly. <laughs> and I'm speaking to the ladies, the men I know you know. But guys, you should also know something. Recently there were articles about the boy child and that we are facing a serious challenge. Because if you are not known for anything, you will fall for anything, isn't it? So please God did not make a mistake of bringing you to earth. Mm -hmm. So we all know God used six days to make the earth. Five and a half, let there, let there. Then the last half, what did he do? He created man and gave him work. My job right now is in the government, I'll retire. But I will never retire from my work. Until I'm called up to earth back to heaven so please find out what it is what are you passionate about why are you on this earth usikue mtu anapita tufu wow or like our former president used to say to rega rega okay and wish you well all right thank you very much dr kimetich your last words please okay thank for, you for very this much. meeting yeah, okay. <laughs> for this meeting <laughs> okay so i think uh, The difference between public and private sector is an op optimality point that it moves depending on country to country. Okay? Some countries, uh, my, my usual yardstick is how much should government intervene in private things? And it's, the optimal point is that point where okay, private sector is not well developed enough to fill that vacuum. Mm -hmm. I feel that we failed Kenya in the 80s with structural adjustment programs mm -hmm. because we were not ready. Because what drives markets? Drives market, markets are driven by informed citizenry. Now our challenge is our citizens are not well informed. The average number of years in school in Kenya is now I think seven years. So we are not even reaching standard eight, the average. So how do you expect such people to participate competitively in markets with very low level of knowledge? So we need informed citizenry. And this has to be nurtured. So government intervention, a clever government therefore will work for those which are not well informed and support them. So. Government, therefore, intervention in the economy 
is to the point to protect those who cannot play in the marketplace. That's it. Those who can play well in the marketplace, you leave private sector and they, they will play it uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. So that, that is usually by yardstick. So as we then figure out as a country what is the balance between what is public and what is private, we will always, that debate should reach an optimal point. And we have seen, for example, in the public transport system, uh, we thought Matatu, Matatus would solve our problem. It actually multiplied our problem. So we need then intervention from government and say, we need some order. Because right now it's private sector driven and you see the chaos. Okay, government is even has tried to form them into circles and it's not doing very well. So, so that to me is a very important thing that any government and private sector interacting needs to find an optimal point where, where is the boundary between what private does and what the government does. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, um, uh, I want just to reiterate the role of parliament, which our parliament has not played very well. You see, parliament as a core, the core of public policy is to represent the interests of the people. And we need to make sure that our parliament, the two houses, are vibrant, there is in a sufficient vibrant debate, especially when you have a new constitution, it gives you a blank sheet to actually draw a lot of public policies because then the core foundation, the constitution is fresh. So there is a lot that it can be done and we need to do that. And the final comment, Joe, is I want the young generation to look at Kenya with fresh eyes. I've looked around the world and um, black people generally need to re-examine themselves and say, what is our place in this planet? What's our place in the world? And my view is that the world is looking for a successful country run by black people. A successful country. And I have always believed that Kenya occupies that space. Why? We have the most educated black people in the world, even with that average of seven years. We have the most educated black people in the world on a proportionate basis. I know people might ask, well, but Nigerians are more. But Nigerians are 200 million. Okay, so in absolute numbers, they could be more educated than us, but in proportionate terms, they are less educated than us. So, the country that will lead the black people in terms of how to govern and taking us to prosperity, ideally should be this one. Can we occupy that space and show the world that black people can run good government? And if we do that, I'm telling you, investors will be coming here in droves. They will be queuing at Jomo Kenyatta Airport and we will then reach full employment. We will be having these young people asking. I received, on average, two CVs per week. People looking for jobs I don't have. I wish I could employ them. But if we just create the necessary environment with a clever government, with clever private sector, and working together symbiotically, I'm telling you, we will be the premier country in the world run by black people. Thank you. Carol. I'll keep it very short. Please because do. a lot has been said. But let me just say three things very fast. To emphasize, let's understand the role of government and not lump everything into government because then we never know when they don't do their job. You know, I think we've articulated what the role of government is, social services, infrastructure, and enabling environment. If we focus government on those areas, and then we can bring private sector to support in those areas and leave private sector to do business and do what it does best then we'll be able to have an efficient uh, government. The third one, the second one, government, e-government. Let's make all government, e-government, 
and let's hold e-government to work away from the cartels away from the sabotage then government will give us the services we are looking for and with the same breath please be innovative you know as we're talking about e-government come up with those solutions for e-government come up with the different platforms and apps that government can use to be able to solve the problems and to be able to make it efficient and lastly my last point our judicial um, what's the word the word has gone jurisprudence or something like that is the burden of proof jurisprudence jurisprudence lies on the person who with the accuser and that has made it very hard to deal with corruption cases which deny us the government services so what we can do even as we push for that to change so that the burden of proof moves back to the accused and we've been seeing government starting to do a bit of that taking people to court and saying show us how you got all this mm -hmm. you know let's push more of that the politicians and everyone if someone is a politician they're saying they're going for this seat and they're saying this is all they have let's ask them how did you acquire let them articulate for us how they acquired let's not ask if they stole they should be arrested it won't happen because they know where the burden of proof lies because i don't know how they acquired so i can't go to court and say i'm a witness but i can make them be on the defense to be able to say how did they acquire that wealth and then we'll start getting rid of those people because as long as those people acquire that illicit wealth they'll continue to deny us the government <coughs> services that's my last point all right thank you thank you very much uh, very illuminating conversation here which obviously cannot end here um, a lot of things um, uh, coming up uh, I mean the uh, progress is clearly being made in government not as fast as uh, uh, many would like to see the question of leadership very central the question of meritocracy coming coming out very clearly and uh, a key phrase that uh, perhaps uh, many of you will carry home is uh, clever government and, and working together with the clever private sector getting enormous results the place of the citizen at the end of the day uh, that leadership uh, whether clever or otherwise is actually put in place uh, by the citizenry and that citizenry if informed can uh, help to keep government even more accountable and also the, the different services that that are then uh, are provided and the role of civil society the role of the other arms of government whether it's the judiciary or or, or, or parliament again uh, also being emphasized and uh, i also picked something that um, i think dr kim Metich called the uh, symbiotic relationship between uh, the the two the two uh, sectors both pr public and fr private and then i think um, uh, caro again capped it up with the idea of being innovative i think that is um, my summary from where i sit but i'm sure you had your own take home so a very big thank you to 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 carol ceo kenya private sector alliance dr julius kim Ngetich, ceo jubilee holdings and of course uh, last but not least uh, uh, my friend <laughs> mulei muya who is the director in the department of public communications uh, in that ministry we all know ICT innovation and, and youth, youth affairs. affairs. Thank you very much to the university and all of you, uh, the audience. I still have a big problem because the ladies refuse to speak, but I will have a private conversation to find out what really happened. But thank you so much. A big round of applause to everybody. Maybe I can say one small one before you speak. Apart from being a parent here, because my daughter goes to the town campus. I came with uh, one of your students who is on attachment in my office. Uh, when there you can stand. Oh wow. Yes. I felt it, it is only good for her to come back home. Thank you. Nice. Thank you very much uh, for the wisdom we have been able to get from you to our guest, uh, Carol, uh, Mulei, and Julius, we really appreciate. And to our moderator, who has made everything to be possible, we much appreciate uh, Bonajo uh, Ageo. At this particular period of time, I want to invite Dr. Fred Spotter to do a vote of thanks the way we are. 
and then thereafter we will have the guests uh, be given their gifts by our own vice chancellor thank you very much uh, our vc and dvc kc university our honorable guests moderator directors my colleagues uh, and all other participants good afternoon um, Permit me to propose a vote of thanks. The sun rises and sets. The flowers bloom and gloom. Likewise to our event today. It started, it has come to an end, and it's my pressure to give a vote of thanks. First and foremost, we start with appreciating uh, the fact that our Almighty God gave us this opportunity to be here today. It cannot be by accident, just waking up in the morning and being here. We may have woken up and something else came in. But now we thank God that we started with God and we have come to the tail end and we really appreciate that fact. Secondly, to our guests. Uh, in the midst of your busy schedule, you not only money to come here on time, but you gave us very valuable, top-notch discussions. Believe you me, when history, KCA University history will be written, you will be part of that history. On behalf of KCA University, I bow my head in gratitude. To our moderator, thank you very much. We owe you for maintaining the temple, for the contribution and all that. May God bless you richly. Um, to our participants, all participants, both online and physical, deans of various schools, chairpersons of various schools, directors of various disciplines, our staff, my colleagues in the faculty, our students, the alumni who were in attendance, accept our appreciation on behalf of KC University. Your contribution has been recognized. And without you, the event could not have come this far. Thank you very much. Our ICT support, not forgetting those behind the cameras, the money to ensure that we reach the online viewers. Thank you very much. I salute you. Last but not least, forgetting, not forgetting the organizers, the planning committee. I can tell you, friends or colleagues, this such event could not have just been thought overnight. It must have taken weeks of planning, days of planning, hours of planning. To that effect, allow me to appreciate this committee and may God bless you. Allow me to say this. As KCA University community, our attitude today has been one of the gratitude. And it has been infinitude and plentitude. Thank you all, and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Spotter, for that. You usually appreciate our guest both in a qualitative manner and in a quantitative manner. And therefore, I request that we do Makofi Anyayo. Moja. Billy. Nashkuru. Funga. Fungua. At this particular period, I want to welcome, uh, call upon our Vice Chancellor, uh, who will be giving the gift to our guests. And again, I want to request our guests to kindly come down to receive your gift from our Vice Chancellor.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tirimba, for this opportunity. Uh, the Vice Chancellor, CEO of KCA University, Professor Wakidiki, uh, Professor uh, Damiana, the DVC, Finance Planning and Development, guest speakers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. So, my name is Dr. Mwendia. I have been requested to close this meeting with a word of prayer. So, let us pray. Uh, Jehovah God, your name is above all names. We thank you for being with us throughout this meeting. Your presence has been in this place from the start to the end. And we want to say thank you. We appreciate you for what we have learned today. Thank you for inspiring us with the ideas that have been shared in this meeting. As we live, continue to guide us with your wisdom. May the things we have learned today stir, your, stir our hearts and we put them into action. May what we have learned impact our lives, families, friends and the rest of the world positively. We say thank you and we pray this breathing. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. So I'll call upon our guests uh, in no particular order. Dr. Julius, you can be the first. Then uh, we love Mulei. And then we have Carol in that order. Let's appreciate them while they're going to get the, the gift. Thank you, Dr. Julius. We have Mulei, Muya. Let's appreciate him once more. Thank you. We now have Carol. Uh, thank you so much. We let's appreciate her in a special way. Then uh, we'll have our moderator, Joe, come in on board. Thank you, Carol, for that uh, wonderful gesture. That is our moderator who has done a perfect job. Thank you so much for honoring the call. Thank you. Uh, I think now, uh, having uh, completed uh, with the, the meeting with the word of prayer, we are going to live in reverse order. That means we are going to start with uh, our vice chancellor and the guests, uh, the deputy vice chancellor, to live. Then uh, we shall be able to live thereafter. DJ, this is the time now to show us what you can do. 